right, hello everyone. Um, welcome back to Gay City's monthly queer community conversations. Um, this is an opportunity to uplift BIPOC-led and serving or organizations and the work they are doing to improve health equity outcomes for our communities. Our segments um, this year will air at varying times and dates each month um, in order to connect with varying audiences, um, especially ones that are connected to the communities that um, we are engaging through this process. Um, so to stay up to date on these dates and times, please visit www.gaycity.org slash queer-community-conversations. Um, my name is Clara Duffy. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the manager of community resources at Gay City, Seattle's LGBTQ Center. Uh, today, we'll be, we will be discussing language access as a social determinant of health and how we can implement it to support our communities. As we begin our program today, we would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. We must remember that settler colonialism is still happening today on this land in the form of gentrification and development. So please, if you live or have lived in Seattle, visit realrentduwamish.org to start paying rent directly to the First Peoples of this land. Lastly, we'd like to discuss three housekeeping items. Um, first, today's Zoom webinar will be recorded. It will only feature the faces of our panelists today, and it can be re-watched re on Gay City's Facebook page. Um, two, throughout the next hour, we encourage you to ask any questions you may have for our guests or even te technical questions in the Q&A function, which is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you have comments or resources to share, please use the chat box, which is also located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, we also wanna set some community guidelines to ensure this webinar provides a comfortable space for our community to engage even in the chat box. Please make space for others to speak leave room for the uncomfortable, practice humility, acknowledge intent versus impact, and speak from your own experience or use I statements. So let's get started. Um, today I am joined by LRT. Um, LRT is the language, ac language access community organizer for API Chaya and is also an organizer for Migrante Seattle. Welcome, LRT. Will you please introduce yourself with your name, pronouns, title, and what brings you to the call today? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, Gay City, for having me. And, um, hope everybody's doing well and enjoying the sunshine after the snow. Um, I'm Lori Rosario Torres. I am LRT for short. My pronouns are they, them. I am the language access community organizer for API Chaya. We are an organization that serves survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking, um, particularly in Asian Pacific Islander communities. Um, but you know, we are standing in solidarity with everyone's collective liberation, especially those of our queer, black, um, indigenous, trans siblings. Um, yeah, so it's pretty cool to be here. <laughs> um, yeah, is that okay for the intro? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, if you want to, do you have anything that you wanted to say about Migrante? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So tonight, oh yeah, I'm here. I'm here to talk about language access and why that's so important. Um, and outside of like, you know, organizing for API Chaya, I am part of an organization called Migrante Seattle. We are um, an organization for Filipino migrant workers and their families. And we particularly organize for the rights and welfare of um, overseas Filipino workers. Overseas meaning like away from the Philippines. Um, if folks don't know, the Philippines is an archipelago in the Pacific Ocean, and its number one export is people, workers. And while you know, 300 years of colonization and continued U.S. imperialism has made us very adept at speaking English, um, 
in order to be able to um, assert basic human rights and basic workers' rights, they have to learn about their rights. And that's best done when you can create safe community spaces. And language is so pivotal for that. Um, and as we know, like the queer community like spans time, space, and reality, and different countries. Um, so, you know, um, LGBTQ folks exist everywhere in every community and might need um, language accessibility. And that's what I do. And that's what I hope we can like all collectively learn how to do in our economic jobs and just out in community. So yeah. Great. Thanks for that intro. Um, if you want to kind of go a little bit deeper in, what is language access? What in, um, I know you kind of touched on it, but what communities do you typically support with that? Sure, um, language access. I've got a handy dandy slide. Oops, that's my video. I've got a handy dandy slide. Let me figure out how to share it on my screen. Um, thanks for your patience. Boom. Uh, unfortunately, this is Facebook Live, and it won't be edited down, but here we go. Um, language access, I, um, just access in general, should be made for everybody, so for visual people, we have our slides. Language access um, means like having meaningful access to program services activities. So when it comes to providing language access, we serve immigrant refugee communities um, or folks who identify as LEP limited English proficiency. I really hate using that label because we're just people and language is, <laughs> English should not, it's a very commonly used language, but moving away from like English centric um, and not just thinking of access as, well, if they can just speak and understand English, that solves the problem, but recognizing like different things like neurotypicality can make that really hard, um, you know, People may not have the same access to education, especially in COVID, um, to have the time, the means to learn a different language. English also comes with a lot of like really messy grammar rules. Anyway, so rather than saying like uh, ESL learners or LEP, just folks who are multilingual or folks who are monolingual, just not English. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, and I'm sure that this is like, especially everything going virtual, um, I'm sure that this is, this is a, like a big thing coming up, um, during the pandemic and during COVID, um, just like being able to get access to like community support or just even like medical support, um, just like various things that we take for granted, um, be like being able to be in person and get, varying degrees of support um like with bringing family members along with us to translate and things like that um so just wondering wondering like how the pandemic fits into like the need for language access right now oh my gosh i remember like beginning of 2020 when we first like i heard about it um people just needed information people needed information right away and i don't know if you know this but medical jargon really hard in English <laughs> and then trying to convey that. So people really needed access to information they could one, understand, and two, that was relevant to them. Um, like understanding how to contain a virus that spreads really quickly, understanding what it looks like to have symptoms, understanding how to keep people safe um, and when and under what circumstances is it safe. And then later on, trying to convey testing should be free. Testing is available, please go get tested as a way to keep your community safe. And now we're starting to move into the realm of vaccines. Um, there's a lot of misinformation about vaccination. And of course we support self-determination. We believe that everyone should have rights and autonomy to their bodies, um, you know, and not have it be regulated or have the decisions made for them. But to make a true choice, you do need information. And it's not just like, oh, well, we translated this in a language, but is the language use actually relevant to the lived experience of people? So the pandemic is huge because not only are you trying to get information to people that they can understand it and understand how to apply it, a lot of it had to be remote and online. Um, and so, yeah, accessibility more and more. The pandemic 
in general really exposed and highlighted um, how one accessibility expands beyond physical access and ability, um, but into language access, into internet access. Um, just what are all of the points of entry to gain our basic human needs? Um, so the team I work for at ATI Chaya were called the Access for All team. So my colleagues and I, I particularly help with language accessibility, training organizations on what it means to make things accessible in language. Everything from if you have front face front facing staff, staff who answer the phones, who like work with community, and they come across somebody who's not fluent in English. Um, what's the protocol? How do you begin to assess needs, identify the language needed, and what do you do? Um, a lot of people try to refer out. Um, and like, you know, in a pinch, people try to use Google Translate. There's a lot of reasons why that's ineffective, or um, it's what you do in a pinch, but overall in the long term, not super helpful. And let alone having trauma-informed language accessibility, especially when you're like working with survivors of violence. Um, and especially when um, language communities are quite small and maintaining confidentiality, creating safety for people to, one, get their needs met. Um, yeah, oh, we've got a question already. Okay, um, how is local government we're currently addressing language access? Uh, is this like a qualitative question? Like, how are they? I don't know. I think they're doing well. Um, or is it how are they addressed? Oh, how are they addressing it? Okay. Um, so King County is where, um, like, we, ATHI serves survivors everywhere. Um, generally, we're working with King County, Pierce County, Snohomish County, um, but other counties too. We're just in Washington State. <laughs> um, and by county, it varies. So King County recognizes that language access is important, but like um, the city of Seattle and King County, most people want to try to identify the big seven language clusters, right? So um, I believe it's like uh, Spanish, uh, Vietnamese, Chinese, uh, Tagalog was in there somewhere, uh, Russian, or Arabic. I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm sure I have it in a slide somewhere, but in essence, there's like seven different languages that are like given funding and resources because they were like deemed the most dense or the most commonly spoken languages. Um, but cultures are not a monolith, right? Even within the Filipino community, I'm Filipino, we have like over 250 languages. Um, so just because it says Filipino, they might actually mean Tagalog, but people might speak Visaya or, um, you know, Ilocano or Waray. Um, and those are separate languages, not dialects. So um, it's better than having nothing. But um, when we don't think about ways to create uh, conditions for people to be able to identify the language that they need, let alone what their needs are that they're seeking services for, you miss a whole pocket of people. Um, yeah. Sorry, this is sad. Am I just supposed to like take the questions as they come? Is that OK? OK. Yeah, that's totally fine, yeah. <laughs> Cool. I hope that was helpful. Um, the uh, King County Public Health is doing their best to do like a lot of um, community-based outreach. They're doing great. I actually, um, it was really heartening to see that they wanted to do more language inclusivity and creating conditions for like language accessibility too. There's um, lots of more uh, more steps towards progress on a governmental level, and also a lot of room to improve and grow. Um, that actually brings me to um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So the way I like to think about local government and just government in general is anything federally, municipality, statewide mandated is a great floor upon which better policies are built. And they're only as strong as um, how well they're enforced. So the Civil Rights Act of 1964 um, was really crucial for uh, helping advance language accessibility um, because our constitution states that you cannot discriminate based on um, national origin. And so if things are not made language accessible, right, then it is a form of discrimination based on national origin. As a result, um, any agency that receives uh, federal funding 
is subject to compliance with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that's one of the ways you can like cite that law to be like, hey, you're not in compliance with this as a way to assert your rights. But of course, that depends on being proficient in English, having somebody who knows the law who speaks English and being able to advocate. Um, there's also, oh, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but let me get to the slide. Uh, love the question though. Yeah, so oops, here we go. Let's do a quick summary. Civil Rights Act of 1964, particularly Title um, Title VI. So no person in the U.S. shall, on the grounds, grounds of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Um, and you might be curious as to who's covered under that. Um, these folks. So um, if you receive, uh, if you're an agency that does education services and you're funded by the Department of Education, if you're doing health and human services, you're funded by the Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Justice, um, Department of Housing. So you might notice that all of these departments have to do with basic human rights. And if these agencies are helping people meet their basic human rights, they have to make it language accessible. Also because of Executive Order 13166. So improving access to services for persons with limited English proficiency. Basically, it's a provision that requires those aid, um, federally funded agencies to actually look through and assess the services that they provide. And are they provided in um, languages that are beyond English? And then being able to identify any need for those services to those with um, people who don't speak English in a proficient way. Sorry, I take up issue with the language of the law and it can be a tool that we use to you know, build better advancements for people. Um, develop and implement a system to provide those services. So back when I said I helped um, organizations develop language access plans and like just have some sort of protocol for when encountering people who um, have different language needs, that's what this means. Um, and if you know somebody who's trying to receive services and you speak English and they don't, and like, you know, the agency itself is not doing its due diligence to provide interpreters or interpretation or translation, you have the grounds to be like, hey, I'm gonna file a complaint. This is directly tied to what your funding is supposed to be used for. Um, again, law is only as great as how well it's enforced. And when there isn't like necessarily um, an office dedicated to taking those complaints or there's not enough funding dedicated to those things, it's really up to community to understand what our rights are and to help advocate and make sure people's rights aren't being violated in that way. It's a little bit of a tangent, but I hope that it answered the question. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was really helpful context. I think that is definitely something that I didn't know. Um, so it's helpful to put that into a like, like what are we actually supposed to be doing for our communities? Um, yeah, I guess like along those lines, because all of the things that you mentioned were in line with basic needs support. And we know that, you know, even though it, like there is this executive order, there's not like the material lived conditions of people, you know, getting their basic needs met if they are not quote unquote, like English language proficient. Um, so what what are the what has been the biggest challenge in getting um, immigrant, especially immigrants and refugees needs met um, in regards to language access other than just like not having enough like resources in their own home language? I mean, yes, there's not enough resources. To me, right, the biggest challenge is even if um, agencies do their best to like provide it, but the communities themselves don't know, right? Um, because it takes like not just having a printed or like a, a what language I speak placard available or even like a brochure that's translated. If that's not in the hands of somebody who's needing that information in that language and they don't have the time to review it, let alone like understand and interpret it, um, it's a challenge. Uh, so it's really like uh, relationships, like the people who 
have relationships within community and are trusted, linking those folks with the, not, the information that they need to be able to convey it, and giving those people support to be able to conduct like thorough outreach. Um, and of course, like it's labor, so I do want like all community members who are trying to do the work of like having an informed community to be justly compensated as community organizers. But more than that, the community, like um, the hope is that like communities are able to have the information and then know what to do with it afterwards. And those are really challenging when a lot of your time is spent trying to survive, um, trying to find jobs, right? Trying to get unemployment. Um, if you're a survivor, trying to get um, services. If you're a parent, trying to ensure that your children are taken care of, especially now, um, trying to balance, you know, do you stay home because you don't want to infect anybody or do you not have a choice but to go out and risk your life and your health to like make sure that your basic needs are met. Um, so it's hard to say what the biggest challenge is, but I can say um, not having uh, like making sure that people know what's available but then also making sure they have the time and the support to access what's available is a big challenge. And some of the things that like have been helpful since the pandemic, um, I think mutual aid is a really wonderful effort and it's a start um, to like, because what was beautiful is like you really saw people wanting, like just being moved to take action and give like basic needs and get them met now in terms of like providing diapers, providing food, providing PPE. That's really great. and to overcome that even more so takes sustained organizing. And that's where API Chaya kind of comes in is um, we do, we're very relational. So we do have like deep relationships with survivors and different grassroots community organizations. We do want to like support people in being well resourced. And um, again, that community education piece, we have our natural helpers program. It is a program that goes over the basics of what human trafficking, domestic violence, sexual assault looks like as like problems and manifestations of violence, but also what any individual and any community can do to truly support survivors. And um, part of supporting survivors is like what you're doing right here at Gay City, creating spaces for people to mutually learn. And then, we, which we're trying to take it one step further beyond just like learning, but to collectively take action through um, Right now, we actually have a campaign on that's really being built, and it's oh, I'm so proud, it's so beautiful, I'm so proud of this community. Um, our campaign, and let me flash it on the slide deck. Uh, hold tight, real quick. It, uh, oops, not that. Ah. Wi-Fi is a lifeline. Um, some folks might have seen it on social media, um, and it, it links very well to language accessibility um, because, like I said before, when the pandemic hit, everybody was just hitting up everyone they knew and the internet. To try to get languages like translated and in lieu of having um, materials translated right away some um, migrants and some um, you know some folks were actually looking up their consulate or their embassy web pages to see if that information about COVID was there and for survivors um, and for an organization that serves survivors it became very clear that being stuck at home because of like shelter in place um, with somebody who might be doing harm. Like that's a very precarious situation when, um, you know, some people might have the only really experienced safety when they were at school or when they were at work. Or like the pressures that come um, that contribute to escalating violence. Um, we know that it's like at times the dynamics being tied to financial hardship, losing jobs, not being able to get unemployment, the pressures that come with that and um, you know, the impact of violence on people at, in the home because of those pressures of not being able to have basic needs met, of having economic hardship. Um, so <laughs> Wi-Fi is a lifeline was a campaign that was really created to view internet access as just so fundamentally essential. It's the stopgap measure for trying to get things in language, stopgap measure for if you are a migrant worker or if you're isolated from community in your home country, that's how you stay connected. Um, you know, even phones, right? If you don't have cell service, you can have Wi-Fi, like do Wi-Fi calling. Um, it's how people like were able to find resources. And so it should have been treated, should still be treated as like an essential um, basic need that shouldn't be taken away in the same way that we have rent moratoriums for, or demanding rent moratoriums for the duration of the pandemic. 
Um, similarly, good quality internet for especially for folks with jobs and school being moved to like remote learning, remote work should be like it's not it should not be an opportunity for companies to capitalize on disaster and hardship, but it should just be made free and accessible. And it's a campaign that really evolved from trying to engage um, paid electeds to like, you know, use the law to um, to compel um, tech companies to provide that. Um, and it's and really our lesson learned was like the community has seen already from how the pandemic was handled. You know, maybe government isn't the best route right now. Maybe of trying to pass a law isn't quick enough to like meet the needs of what's happening now. And so what's really beautiful is communities are actually starting to have um, community network projects, meaning like actually identifying buildings in your neighborhood that could be like the big um, source of like Wi-Fi signaling um, to make it accessible that way and to be run and owned and operated by community. Um, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, and of course, again, it ties back to how are we creating conditions for our communities to not just survive, but thrive. And hopefully not just in the face of a pandemic, but just period. Um, yeah, that's what APHI is trying to do, along with our natural helpers training, along with doing Know Your Workers Rights um, in different languages to the best of our ability. We're just really into education and relationships and campaigns. Please join. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that, that kind of just went right into my next question, which, which was, um, yeah, to just like talk about like how how communities are working to increase their access to um, to language resources um, and and yeah, just like being able to speak their own language and not have to, you know use English because of proficiency um, or the request for people to be proficiency proficient in English here. Um, if you have more to say on that, feel free. Otherwise, we can move on to the next one because you gave several very important examples. Yeah, um, I think on the point of campaign, um, Wi-Fi is a lifeline is a very specific one. Please do support it. We're trying to make it so that way um, youth and survivors can actually get technical training on how to um, establish and operate and maintain um, internet uh, access points, which is super cool. Um, and at the same time, the overall campaign that that falls under is starting to frame accessibility and language access as a human right. And that's what the slide that I just pulled up kind of like frames it as. So I don't think people would argue that we need, we have basic needs, right? Um, physiological, safety, belonging, esteem, and finally, the very, very, what is it, um, evasive self-actualization. So when everything moves to being remote, um, yeah, how do you access your physiological needs? Some people are like, you know, getting groceries delivered to them. Um, some communities really needed language specific, um, uh, services to make sure that like they could um, access things like emergency groceries or like to know where to get the gift cards that were going through mutual aid um, or even accepting gift cards because if a stranger's like here take this gift card yell a little sus right um, yes and then a big topic is safety in our community um, and safety doesn't necessarily mean police in fact um, oh gosh <laughs> I think something to take note of in that little chart where it says who receives federal funding, the Department of Justice was listed, right? So folks who are incarcerated and, um, you know, uh, people who have to like deal with Department of Justice. One thing that really sparked the need for language access for our agencies in particular was um, seeing a trend of, um, survivors of domestic violence actually being arrested. Uh, I don't know if folks know this, but Washington is a mandated arrest state. Meaning, um, and you know, I think it's great that people recognize domestic violence is wrong. And they have now like, you know, I find it to be a crime. If it is a crime, according to the current justice system, the police have to be called. So mandated arrest means that if a police, if police are called, 
specifically to respond to a domestic violence situation, they have to arrest someone. Now, if these calls are happening late at night, if they're happening in like areas that are like a little bit more secluded, it takes time and money and resources to get an interpreter on site when you realize that one, if not both, are not English speakers. And you can imagine when it comes to power dynamics, who would be believed if the due diligence to get interpretation wasn't done. So a lot of victim defendants, um, victim defendants meaning they were actually the survivors of the violence and harm being done, but they were the ones arrested. And how many cases could have gone differently if there were interpreters there? Um, another need for language access uh, work was um, advocates who are bilingual. Oh my gosh, bless all the multilingual people trying to like do, do right by their community. Y'all work so damn hard. You guys need to be compensated well and just like self-care and just be nourished because advocates, especially in the pandemic, are doing so much more if they're multilingual. In fact, a lot of advocates were sharing how um, a job's, a, an advocate's job is to um, really try their best to connect the um, survivor to resources, to really um, situate and position themselves to help like advocate and create the conditions for like the things that would support the survivor's well-being and uphold the survivor's self-determination. You can't do that when most of your time is being spent being the intermediary between someone offering service and the survivor who needs um, English interpretation. It's in fact, if the advocate is being treated as the interpreter, the advocate then can't advocate and help clarify things or help like make sure that the service provider is understanding the particular needs. Um, all that is to say is uh, going back to language access as a human right. Basic things that people need are safety, education, a decent like conditions of living, and physical and mental well-being. So no matter where you're from, how old you are, age, ability, race, gender, class, you're a human. You deserve these things. And how can you ensure those things are upheld if you can't even communicate what you need? So a lot of people think that it's just enough to have resources in different languages. But do those resources, are they the actual solution to the experience that a survivor is having? And how do you know? How do you know what you're offering is actually what they need? if you're not actually creating the conditions for them to um, communicate and be understood. And could you imagine like all the pain you have to survive and everything you have to go through and then to like have to not only convey what you need in a language you don't speak, but then have people like, you know, just your story would change so much if you had to like not only say it in a different language, but the language doesn't encompass the depth of what you experience as a human in that moment and why you need what you need. Um, yeah, so if you don't have a way to be understood what your needs are, it's an issue of how we collectively can uphold human rights, um, you know, to safety, life, fair and just proceedings. Trafficking, right? Um, a lot of traffickers take advantage of the fact of that there's like a language barrier. Um, legal jargon, hard to understand when you speak English you know, and to be able to use the law to protect you, you need to have a grasp of it. You know, um, there's like a lot of things we take for granted that are human rights that require language to have. And that's why it's not just like, oh, we're not gonna de dedicate funding because it's like a special interest. You know, like there are over, like there's so many more languages than just the English being spoken. There's so many more people who need to access these rights. and yeah, that's why it's not a special interest or a special need. It is like baseline. This like, this area likes to talk about racial justice and racial equity. The best like manifestation of racial equity is do you have space for people of different races to show up with like their, you know, um, their full culture, including their language? Um, so, you know, language is often the first thing to get erased when you come to the US. Food lasts though, because food is universal, everyone knows. But yeah, so what can we do to make sure that language doesn't get erased in order for people to like meet their needs? Oh, we got a question. Yay, question. 
Yeah. Um, so this person asked, in what ways do you see gender and language justice intersecting? Has language evolved to be more inclusive, inclusive of different genders, especially as language continues to evolve differently overseas versus here on Duwamish land? Mm, wow, that's a larger question. I am not a professor or a linguist, um, but I'll do my best. So language, I, and I love that you went straight for it, language justice um, versus language access. So access is just basically like, what do I need to be able to participate? Language justice is, what can we do so I can show up as my whole self, including my language in this space? Thank you for that. And yeah, gender has a role to play, right? Ugh, I can't girl. And it's G-O-R-L, girl, gender neutral. Um, can't even begin to tell you how hard it is to explain pronouns. I go by they, them. I identify as non-binary. That's a, that's a trip to explain in Tagalog. <laughs> uh, the language my parents speak. My dad actually speaks way more, but um, yeah, because in particularly in Tagalog, there isn't like he, she, there's sha. Everybody, so that person over there, sha. Um, and yeah, gender, it's interesting because it, it varies culturally, right? It's, um, and it's something that's at once like deeply personal and then sometimes beyond our control as queer, like gender queer folks. It's deeply personal because we get to choose our identity and we should be able to choose how it gets expressed. We don't have control over how people read us. And the language people use to describe us, we have even less control over sometimes, interpersonally. But when we create community as like CD BIPOC folks and normalize things and like give more support to educate broadly, um, it starts to help shift language and our use of language. Um, so I don't know if evolution is quite the term I would use. Um, and I don't know if inclusive works well either. I think it's more um, when language is leveraged in a way that helps uphold human dignity, um, regardless of gender or affirms gender expression. Like when we can leverage language as a tool to like connect and affirm one another, um, that's pretty cool. I also, um, I want to caution too. I think language is such a powerful thing and it's not the be all end all. Um, cause I think, and I want to be careful because I want to live in a world where people can just be who they are and be like, not have to experience gender dysphoria, not have to experience violence. And the world we live in is all of those things are happening on top of basic needs not being met. And I'm not sure, given the effort and energy and time needed, I think personally as LRT, um, when things as dire as like immediate safety and like physiological needs like food and medical care need to happen. Um, I think like, yes, people should do their due diligence not to misgender and like perpetuate that kind of violence. And um, the energy spent on making sure these basic needs are met regardless of like link correctness of language in that moment, it's, it's a nuance that I think people don't really discuss. Because I, I think it's beautiful that a community will like do its best to like assert and make sure that language doesn't do violence um, and make like, you know, trigger folks. And um, language should be leveraged to help us acquire like the material things we need to survive. Um, I think I went on a tangent again. So sorry, guys. I, I am not neurotypical. I have ADHD and I like tangents. I hope that answers your question, anonymous attendee. <laughs> I don't think that was a tangent. It sounded perfectly on task to me. Um, yeah, thanks for answering that. Um, I think that brings me a little bit to um, just like the theme of this year's queer community conversations is uh, like 
um, increasing our community's access to um, health to uh, improved health equity outcomes. So increasing communities access to social determinants of health. Um, and that's like a big term, but essentially just like what you're saying, having access to our basic needs. Um, and we're like thinking of health as like a really broad term, right? And like, like this is all encompass encompassing, like not just like physical, emotional, and like spiritual health, but like, like all of us, like being able to live in quality spaces, being able to like, um, have access to social support and things like that. Um, so if you could just be, or just like go into a little bit, like the connection between language access and like language access as a social determinant of health and like how it improves health equity outcomes for communities. Oh, uh, I'm not a statistician, so I don't have like quantitatively, here's like the percent increase. What I can say, is um, man being being able to have full autonomy and determination over our bodies is so key. Um, and back to the point of like how to um, have language uphold people's self determination and like their gender identities and expression. Yeah, um, when it comes to uh, being able to have medical information available to and being able to understand it to make an informed decision about your body. Huge social determinant of health, like having basically having in medical information in your language conveyed to you in a way that you can understand so you can make an informed decision about your body and your life mm -hmm. that determines the quality of life, the length of your life. Um, cause even in English, people don't often know that like patients have a bill of rights. Patients, you know, you have the right to say, I don't agree with what this doctor is telling me about my body. I'm the one living in it and experiencing these things. I get to have a second opinion. Um, the positionality of like the authority doctors have, especially over somebody who literally doesn't speak their language. Um, people do have a lot of trust in doctors because they're coming to you like I'm in pain or I'm hurting or there's something I'm concerned about. The expectation is the doctor will do the thing to alleviate that. Um, and the re you know, to have access to, um, to resources that could help with preventative care so you don't ever have to get to a dire situation. To have access to understand how to navigate financially paying for medical access when you don't have a job or you don't have that status. Um, being able to uh, delicately word things so that way you're not deprived of a certain treatment that you know works for you. Um, you know, like how many women have had to like say like, oh, I have to regulate my cycle just to have autonomy over like birth control. How many people had to like, you know, undergo a really damaging and impacting mental health diagnosis to be able to have, um, you know, gender affirming treatment. Like, all of those things exist and language plays a key part. Again, if you just strip it down to, can people convey what they need is just a basic step, let alone have those needs be understood and respected. Um, so I think language access plays a big part, just meeting the baseline. But to improve just medical access and care for all, especially for folks who are marginalized, migrant workers, um, queer, black, um, indigenous, trans people of color, like language can be a step, but our practice in how we value human beings carries us most of the way through and where our values like drive us to place our funding and our energy and our resources. Yeah. Um, so yes, like it's not an either or, it's like, yes, please make things language accessible. Please have gender affirming language. Please be trauma informed. And like, you also need to think about how your doctors are handling like um, queer and transness in the medical community and like the impacts of like having to have this particular mental diagnosis to be able to access being comfortable in our bodies. I have thoughts and feelings, 
not an expert. I am just somebody who has worked to try to help communities create the conditions for themselves to survive all the horrible systemic things we have to survive. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's, um, yeah, I think it's a very like, it's like that, like what that question, the question from our community member, I think that it's a very like nuanced, uh, it's very complex and nuanced because I think all of it is basic human rights. And I think it's hard to, it's like, it's difficult to get to, um, the place where we like, you know, um, prioritize one over the other. Um, and I don't think we should have to. Um, and I also think that like, in the midst of all of these, with all of these complex intersections, there are like community members are having to like pick priorities of like what what, you know, like a person who is like a trans person who is also you know, working in an unsafe work environment and needs, you know, needs to be able to get medical care um, for the the conditions that they're facing at their job, right? Like, it's going to be a little bit more of a priority for them in that moment to, to figure out their medical situation and have the language to describe that. Um, but also with another, like an equal priority of like being able to like, to know, uh, or to like, you know, be fully expressed, like be their, their own person and, and, and not, not have to, and like have the language that they want to use to describe themselves as well. Um, Cause we all know language is limiting, especially the English language. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Sorry, I just realized you, you had a question particularly about how it improves health equity outcomes for immigrants and refugees. Um, I think, especially given the previous administration we just survived, and you know, we don't necessarily think that the current administration has lots of weight opportunities to prove accountability and to improve. Um, uh, the health equity outcomes for immigrants and refugees. Um, you know how you get like the homie hookup when you can like uh, help people navigate certain things by telling them what information to give, what's relevant, what's not, um, or just being like, hey, I know somebody who will be able to provide these things and not have posed the same barriers that you're facing with this other place. Um, a lot of that is like implied <laughs> and relationship based when you convey that, um, especially when it's a different language. So, you know, um, I guess I'll use an example of like, um, well, I have an example and I'm grappling with the best way to use it. Right I'm gonna opt not to, but basically um, when you're grappled with somebody wants to disclose information, but they want to keep it incredibly confidential, but somebody like, you know, if the nature of your job requires you to report the thing that they asked to be kept confidential. Um, how do you convey you have self-determination and autonomy to share what you want to share? And these might be consequences um, when somebody like, you know, might not be regulated and might want to just like talk and talk and talk. And yeah, I'm not, I think people should be held to a strong code of ethics. And I think um, in trying to get people's needs met and ensure safety, safety is a broad term and like publicly and collectively needs to be reevaluated of like what creates safety and how language plays a role in that. Um, yeah. It improves health equity outcomes just to know that somebody cares enough about you to like help connect you to what you need. And that trust is more easily put in place when they can just freely express because it's in a language that they understand. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. And then I guess uh, as we're coming to a close, um, what what are the resources that you would recommend for folks? And uh, just a reminder that we will be able to email these out um, 
after this this call so don't feel like you have to like scribble them down <laughs> um but yeah what are some resources you would recommend to our community members who are listening so glad you asked um, i'm actually going to flash their um, websites right now um and pause the share new share and haha i will say the seamless gives me an excellent opportunity to like learn more skills around tech okay the first that i want to share with you all is oops not this one. Um, it's Gay City. They're an excellent resource. Please support them. <laughs> uh, I uh, have okay. to do a new share so that we can see it. Oh, oh stop share. OK, um, thank you. And can you see it now? Right. Um, so justcommunities.org um, is great uh, to like talk more about um, doing uh, language justice work um, and being able to like have multilingual spaces around social justice. Excellent organization. I really love the Asian Pacific Institute Ending Gender Based Violence. Um, they have um, resources on their website about culturally specific advocacy, getting technical assistance or training on language access. Um, they're based in San Francisco. If you want training on language access, please hit me up. I will flash my email in just a second. Um, but yeah, just please do visit their website. They have really great starter resources on language accessibility, what it means, even um, a template on having a language access plan for your organization or just for yourself. Um, and oh, not what I meant to do. Can you still see the screen? Or no, not anymore. Oh, not anymore, sorry. Oh, Mercury. Okay. Uh, let me make this a little bit small for me. I'm sorry, when I do Zoom, the top bar kind of covers the tabs, and I like having many tabs. Oh, this one. Um, the Center for Participatory Change. Excellent website, too. They have a whole curriculum dedicated to um, how to, if you are interested, if you're multilingual and you're interested in doing like social justice work. Um, or like doing interpretation, they have a whole curriculum on how to do that. It's really cool. And um, I also have a list of uh, captioning life, uh, captioning in real time interpreters. So for folks who um, are hard of hearing or deaf, who need the visuals, I personally need to read to um, process something. Yeah, heart interpretation is super great. I have a list of those folks that you can support so they can help support community. It's a nice symbiotic relationship we got going. But yeah, um, my name is LRG. You can find me at, um, wait, I'm going to flash the slide with my contact information. Just give me one second. In hindsight, I could have put this all in one slide, but I thought it'd be cool to like do a live look through this really cool website. I'm silly. But that I'm looks back. great. I love it. <laughs> Thanks. I think I like it better when people can talk to me live. I love the Q&A thing, but now I'm realizing I talk to Bill space, guys. I'm having a very subtle moment right now. <laughs> okay, oops. Oh yeah, um, we have the language access organizer program that I head up if you want to join it. Um, these are old events, but the program's still going around training people to support community education. If you're multilingual, we will hook you up with all the content so you can facilitate in your own community. But here is how to contact Access for All. I'm LRT. I do language access. I can help you or your community with how to create language access um, protocols and plans and give technical assistance. My colleague, Jesse, is our disability justice organizer. So if you are very passionate about um, combating ableism, supporting queer community and queer disabled communities, please, please do hit them up. She's amazing. Yeah, I hope there's enough resources. We will send you an email. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I am going to go through our closing. Uh, oh, we got a comment. It is. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> thank you, Kat. <laughs> yes, please be awesome. getting contact. Yeah, thank you so much for participating today. Um, 
So uh, in closing, thanks for joining us on Queer Community Conversations. Um, I would like to say an extra special thank you to LRT for the wonderful breakdown on language access. Um, and to our audience, we will follow up via email with a brief evaluation and survey and or evaluation survey and any resources that we mention on this call. Um, also, please remember that Gay City is still offering services such as HIV STI testing, our prep clinic, healthcare navigation, and our resource referral phone line and databases. Um, so if you're still seeking support, please contact, contact us today or Monday through Friday from 2 to 5 p.m. at 206-323-5428 um, or visit gaycity.org. Um, and also please join us again next time on March 15th from 7 to 8 p.m for a presentation on reproductive justice. Um, we'll be joined by uh, the organization Surge Repro Reproductive Justice. So um, it's gonna be a great call. And we're really excited to see you all there. Um, thanks again for joining us today. My name is Clara Duffy and we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. Thank you.